Mika. Thank you. Today we reveal the name of Nelson Mandela. He led the fight against apartheid until we won. And today South Africa is free. Say what? Yeah. I said today South Africa is what? free. Yes. yes. Today South Africa is yes. free. You like that. Yes. And his work on earth is done. <laughs> so Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. call him. We thank you for answering the call. Your life, your life, your work, your work, your spirit, your spirit has served as an inspiration to us all. We have fun. Here we go. Courageous struggle that the world has ever seen. He was held captive in South African prison for 27 years. Uh, 27 years. But he fought with truth, justice, righteousness, and had no fear. He had no fear. Nelson, Nelson Mandela. We love you, Nelson Mandela. We thank you. Nelson Mandela, we honor you, Nelson Mandela. He stood up for right and pointed out the truth for the whole world to see. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. He was declared an enemy by the racist government. The racist government. Then in 1994, the people elected him the president Nelson Nelson Mandela Nelson Mandela we love you Nelson Mandela we love you Nelson Mandela thank you Nelson Mandela thank you Nelson Nelson Mandela one more time Nelson Nelson Mandela we love you, Nelson Mandela. We thank you, Nelson Mandela. We honor you, Nelson Mandela. He fought for freedom in South Africa until we won. We'll continue to fight for freedom until work is done. He fought for freedom in South Africa until we won. And we'll continue to fight for freedom until the work is done. One more time. He fought for freedom in South Africa until we won. And we'll continue to fight for freedom 
until the work is done. Nelson Mandela, Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. You can sing with us now, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Come on now, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. One more time, Nelson. Nelson Mandela Nelson Nelson Mandela Mandela says fight for freedom. Mandela says freedom now. He showed us the way to victory in our land, South Africa. Mandela, Mandela. He led us away from a in our land, South Africa. In our land, South Africa. Rolly clock clock. Rolly clock clock. Monday. Freedom was in your hand. Freedom was in your hand. You showed us. We sing the song with a heavy heart this morning because the man that we consider to be the most significant man to walk on the face of the earth in the 20th century no longer walks with us in life. Last December 5th, December 5th, Nelson Mandela turned into our ancestor. His middle name is Roly Claw Claw. Roly Claw Claw. Roly Claw Claw. Monday. Freedom was in your hand. Freedom was in your hand. You showed us the way to victory. You showed us the way to in our land, South Africa. In our land, South Africa. We also sing this song with a happy heart this morning. Because we got to live and walk Freedom the earth at the, the same time as Nelson Mandela. Hand. And the witness his greatness and his inspiration and his leadership you firsthand. The, the name Nelson Mandela will live in the hearts and minds of our people forever and ever and ever. We the Stones of Fire now honor Nelson Mandela with the moment of silence.
will say? We have come to that time in our service that we call our historical tribute uh, with a little bit of drum interlude in between. Thank you, Brother Sidney. Uh, it's a time, it, the tribute is a time that we take out each and every Sunday to pay honor, to pay homage, to pay tribute to some significant, not necessarily famous, but significant person, place, or event in our, in our history, in African history. And we do it because we know if we don't remember ourselves, we will be forgotten. And if we don't honor ourselves, it's not going to happen. Uh, we have different people come from the congregation every Sunday to do a historical tribute. If you're interested in doing one, please see Brother Sango sitting right there. This morning's presenter is our beautiful sister, uh, who, when last she was here, did a beautiful poem on Imar Imamu Baraka, yep. right? And she's here to bring us another tribute this morning, uh, a tribute this morning. Welcome, Sister Basola. Doctor Basola. Okay. Um, uh, today, my presentation focuses on the role of slavery in the development of the major institutions of higher education in this country. I bring it to underscore the fact that we should not look up to these institutions as if they are the paragons of a higher way of being, as they, like most of the um, social structure in this society, were built on our ancestors' back. Mm -hmm. We have to debunk the hype that is meant to inspire awe and make people feel small in relationship to these places, in relationship to the degrees uh, that they can uh, that they convey uh, we should see them only as places to get some of the information we need to create knowledge of and for ourselves to grow our wisdom and to build our own institutions of higher learning now I tell you about dr. Ben Johanan who always is uh, can be counted on to bring it home what he used to say is uh, he said you know don't be taken out by no doctor or PhD degree. He said, because the first man that bestowed a PhD didn't even have one himself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to let this uh, do the rest. I want to, uh, this is the uh, brother, his name is Craig Stephen Wilder, and it's on Democracy Now. He's the author of Ebony and Ivy, uh, and he's talking about how these institutions were built on our ancestors' back. No more auction block for me, sweet honey in the rock. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we turn to a new book, 10 Years in the Making, that looks at... ...how some of the country's major universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Rutgers, Williams, the University of North Carolina, to name just a few are drenched in sweat and sometimes the blood of Africans brought here as slaves. The book is called Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. In it, MIT history professor Craig Stephen Wilder reveals how the slave economy and higher education grew up together. He writes, the American campus stood as a silent monument to slavery. Well, this history is silent no more. Professor Craig Stephen Wilder joins us here in New York. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you very much. So, uh, talk about America's most elite universities. What relation do they have to slavery? I, I think there are multiple relationships. The first and um, probably most poignant, most um, provocative, is the relationship to the slave trade itself. Um, in the middle of the 18th century, from 1746 to 1769, fewer than 25 years, less than a quarter century, the number of colleges in the British colonies triples from three to nine. The original three were Harvard, Yale, and William and Mary, and all of a sudden there were nine by 1769. Um, and it triples in that 25-year period. That 25-year period actually coincides with the height of the slave trade. Um, it's precisely the rise and the um, elaboration of the Atlantic economy um, based on the African slave trade that allows for this sort of fantastic articulation of um, a new growth of the institutional infrastructure of the colony. So let's talk specifically about particular universities. I mean, you are, you do look at some universities in the South, but mm -hmm. also in the yeah. deep north, yeah. Harvard. It's a very northern story, actually. You know, when you think about um, the colonial world 
until the American Revolution, <coughs> there's actually only one college in the South, um, William and Mary. Uh, there are a couple of other attempts, but they fail. The other eight colleges are all northern schools, um, and they're actually located in key sites for the most part of the merchant economy, and where the slave traders had sort of come to power and rose as the sort of financial and um, intellectual backers of the new culture of the colonies. So talk about Harvard. Sure. Um, Harvard, actually, from its very beginnings in 1636, um, the college by 1638, actually has an enslaved man living on campus who's referred to as the Moor. Um, and the Moor. The Moor. And uh, that actually is directly related to two slave trades. Um, I, I, I imagine it's how he gets to Cambridge. Um, one is right after the Pequot War, the war in which the Puritans defeat the um, Indians of um, southern Connecticut. There's a Pequot slave trade into the West Indies. The captive Pequot are actually sold into the West Indies. Um, that ship actually returns with enslaved Africans. And it's right after that moment that the Moor, the Moor appears on campus <laughs> and becomes part of the sort of legend of early Harvard. Toward the end of the book, you mm -hmm. include a photograph that shows five men who served as president yeah. of Harvard University from 1829 to 1862. Talk about their significance and relation to slavery. The, what I wanted to show in that final chapter, that final epilogue, was the um, ways in which slavery, even after the end of slavery in the Northeast, even after the northern colonies and northern states had actually moved toward emancipation and finished their emancipation processes, um, they continued to have economic ties to the South and the West Indies. Um, and so if you, one of the ways you can trace that is just by looking at who became the president of these universities, who the presidents were. And the presidents were virtually always the sons or the sons-in-law of merchant traders, um, people who were West India suppliers. And so after the slave trade ends and after slavery ends in the northern states, one of the businesses that continues is supplying the South and the West Indies with everything, all the provisions that they needed to run the plantation. So I want to look at this picture sure. again. You've got Quincy, you've got Everett, mm -hmm. um, you've got... What is it? Sparks? Yeah, Sparks. Uh, Mather. Jared Sparks. And Felton. Mm -hmm. Explain. For example, Mather. In mm -hmm. fact, at Harvard University, there is a house named after Yeah, Mather. the Mathers actually go back a long way. And so, you know, and they actually are part of the colonial story of slavery, too. Increase Mather um, of the second generation is actually um, a president of Harvard. Um, and he uses his slave, which was the, a person given to him by his parish. Um, he uses his slave to actually run the business of the college in the colonial period. The slave runs errands um, between the various trustees, um, and he writes in his diary that he sent his Negro to do various bits of work for the college. And if you think about, you know, Edward Everett, Jared Sparks, um, one of the ways that their influence, that they had managed to achieve the kind of influence that they did, Sparks, for instance, um, becomes rather famous actually for his writings about early American history. Um, he becomes something of a really quite a polished American historian. But that was actually a way of also creating ties with the South, um, intellectual relationships with the South. And so his writings as a historian also allowed him to create intellectual connections to these very important regions, um, and, and regions that remained important in the financing of higher education long after slavery ends in the Northeast. What about Yale University? Yale actually is a very similar story. You know, in 1701, when the original founders are actually meeting to establish the, what was then the collegiate school, um, they, as one of their um, chroniclers puts it, they come from the various towns to meet up, um, and they're followed by their men servants or their slaves. Um, the, slave, the enslaved people are actually at the founding of the institution. Um, and once it's established, like most of the 18th century colleges, and especially by the 18th century as the slave trade peaks, um, the new business of higher education, the financial model for a successful college, requires, in fact, tapping into these new sources of wealth in the Americas. And that means the slave trade and the plantations of the South and the West Indies. Did anyone at these universities, and I think you talk about it, Yale, mm -hmm. say no to slaves? Yes. Yes. You know, there's, at every moment that there's a push towards slavery, there's also anti-slavery. There's an anti-slavery tradition actually emerging um, 
in, from the 17th century right through the 18th century. And much of it, because it's an intellectual movement, because it's a moral and religious movement, is actually housed on campus. And you, so you have this tension on campus, and I try and actually point that out at various times in the book. Um, one of the examples that I use actually relates to the image that you showed of the presidents, and particularly Quincy. Um, under Quincy's administration, um, Charles Fallon, the German uh, historian, the, I'm sorry, the German professor at um, Harvard, uh, who was a rebel of the, um, uh, in Germany and who was chased out for his radicalism, comes to the United States, gets appointed professor of German at Harvard, and then is immediately attracted to the abolitionist movement. Fallon is actually punished for that decision. Um, he eventually loses his professorship, and when you trace the origins of the professorship, the funding had largely come from families with ties to the slave trade and slavery. I mean, that's yeah. very interesting what you point out at places like Harvard, yeah. is that a lot of the endowments for the professor chairs yeah. come from s yeah. the slave trade. Yeah, the first, actually the very first um, endowed professorship at Yale the Livingston Professor of Divinity actually comes from the Livingston family of New York and New Jersey. Um, and it's the second generation Philip Livingston gives it in um, basically recognition of the fine education that his sons had received at Yale. Um, and Livingston is one of the, uh, the Livingstons are one of the larger slave trading families out of New York City. The rivals for places like Newport, Rhode Island and, and Providence, which dominates the North American trade, certainly the Philadelphians and the New Yorkers were trying Sorry, but I have some um, I have some slips here uh, with the information where you can c go and see this online yourself, and uh, I also have the information about um, Wilder's book. So that's it. And as I said, it's brought with this idea that hey, it's not all that. <laughs> <laughs>
You see the South Africans dressed in red. God's gonna trouble the water. They are the ones that Mandela led. Trouble in the water. Come on and wave. You see those people dressed in blue. God's gonna trouble the water. They are good Africans like me and you. God's gonna trouble the water. Come on and wave. Come on and wave. Come on wave. You know that God's gonna trouble the water. Come on, wait. Wait in the water. You know that God's gonna trouble the water. You know that God's gonna trouble the water. You know that God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Brother Damu Sudi Ali on the piano, Brother Minister Greg on the drum. <laughs> That's all you need sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you just need a little music. I say. We give thanks and praise to the one that created us, the one who has been known by many names, sometimes known as Amin Ra, sometimes known as Patai, sometimes known as Ola Damari, sometimes known as Allah, sometimes known as Nomo, sometimes known as Ngai, sometimes known as Jehovah, sometimes known simply as I am that I am, that great spirit, that great power that we give honor and praise to, and we say, Ashe. Say it like you mean it, Ashe. Ashe. 
the most high let you be here today and you give thanks and we say ashe the most high gave you that breath that you didn't have to think about this morning you didn't stay up all night wondering if you was going to take the next breath ashe when you got up this morning rain wasn't hitting you in your forehead unless it was by choice because everybody in here has a place to live ashe you know when you got up this morning most of you went to your refrigerator and there was something there ashe most of us woke up with our reasonable right mind Ashe. What do you think, Brother Shango? Most of us woke up with our right mind. Most. Most. And we say Ashe. <laughs> we give thanks and praise to our ancestors, the ones who uh, lived before us, the ones who gave us examples of good living. Of good living. Because all ancestors ain't good ancestors. Sometimes they just died. <laughs> Come on. You know it's true. And they're going to they had to come back and figure it out the next time. Ashe. But we give honor and praise to ancestors. Like when we call Nelson Mandela's name, we feel spirit. When we sing his song. We feel his presence. Our ancestors taught us that ancestors live. This is not some conception. This is not some perception. This is a truth that our ancestors believed in fully. That you could be in this life, and when you left this life, you still were in communication with the people here and the spirit world. That's an African idea. That there's no separation. There's not them over there and us over here. That if you, call, if you believe it and you call on your ancestors in the same way that you call on all the spiritual beings, the same way you call on God, their ancestors will be with you in your struggle. I don't think you heard me. That that's a profound truth that our ancestors share with us and that we have to put into action all the time. That it's not something we teach our children is we want them to believe it and then use it. To help them decode what's happening out here in this world. We give honor and praise to our elders. The ones who are older than us, who give us wisdom, who can encourage us. And for our elders, we're happy. We, can, we continue to pray for Mama Conke's mother and all those elders who are struggling with, you know, with, with life. Because it's really not health problems. It's life. Yeah. It's the end of life, the beginning of life, the middle of life. We're always struggling through life, Ashe. Yeah. That's just our makeup as human beings. So I ask our, my elders in the room for permission to continue. Is it all right that we continue and the elders yeah. say it's all right? I want to thank all of you for being here. Look around and smile at somebody. We are present. Smile at somebody. Ashe. We, we all over the room. Mama Fu in the back waving. We smiling, right? Ashe. We like being with each other. That's why we come. We like playing music together. You know, we like singing together. We like studying together. We like eating together. And we like thinking about and, and wrapping our mind around spiritual ideas. Because when we wrap our mind around these spiritual ideas and work with them and massage them and play with them, it makes our lives better. We believe that we're not just going through the motions, that everything we learn that has a spiritual meaning makes our life better. Ashe? So this morning, I want you to open your Husea, turn to page 64, and there should be some Husea's on your seats. Page 64. Page 64. And I just want to spend a few minutes inviting you to think along with me, inviting you to, to Think about what is your code? What is your code? Setting yourself to become wise. What is your code? As usual, I've spent time in a couple of places since I last saw you. I was in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, doing that big ice storm. I don't think I've been here since then. Uh, and that was, some, you know, an inch of snow shut down the city. <laughs> And my friends in New York and Chicago just laughing, <laughs> just laughing. But my friends in D.C., they weren't laughing because they, <laughs> they know how D.C. is to say, we'd be like this snow the inch and a half out here. We wouldn't know what to do, right? Then I, went, I came home for a few days and then went to Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was righteously cold. And by that, I mean it was real cold. It was like 18 degrees outside. Then it warmed up on Super Bowl Sunday, and it was about 50 degrees. People walking around with shorts on like it was warm. And then the temperature dropped again, and, and it snowed heavily, and, and uh, the kids were out of school, and everybody was, you know, out for the day. But the reason I bring it up is because I just give thanks to the Most High because 
yeah, I don't take it for granted when I get on a plane or if I get on a train, if I get on a bus, that everything's going to be smooth. And I went through all those weather zones and time zones without any real hassles on, this, on my mission, on my journey, looking at the issues of black men and boys in the United States. Everywhere I go, that's basically what I'm doing. I'm asking people questions. I'm sharing what we're doing here in Oakland. I'm asking, you know, like I'm Bumblebee almost, just fertilizing ideas here and there, helping people run meetings associated with this topic. And sometimes things happen where you feel like there's a special secret African code that's going on. Because you'll see something or you'll do something or somebody be wearing a certain fabric or they got a certain piece of jewelry on and then you say, oh, that's an African right there. Like, you, you start picking each other out, right. right? And I made a reference. I'm going to talk about this a little bit today. I made a reference to the Dogon's understanding of the cosmos, the Dogon understanding of their philosophy about how you decode the spiritual code that should be a blueprint for your life. And, and the word that I used was beniso. And we'll talk about is they believe there was knowledge was delivered on four levels. There was giri so, beni so, bolo so, and so die. And I just made a passing reference to beni so, and there was a brother in the room in Philadelphia, and he said, oh, that's the Dogon piece. And I was like, okay, here they go one. <laughs> and somebody else asked me, if they, they, something I said or did had something to do with my eye. And the brother came up to me after and said, you talking about like my eye out of Kemet? I was like, yeah. So, you know, just know that there's people around the country, people around the world, same thing happened in Brazil, people around the world who are relating to this African word, this African language, this African code. So what is your code? In the computer world, in the world of technology, um, yesterday and today, there's an event that's going on right here in Oakland, and it's basically an event for young black males to teach them how to do computer coding, to write the programs. See, it's one thing to sit there and play a game. It's something else to understand the programming behind that game. The zeros and ones that got manipulated in a mathematical way to give information into a memory system to actually manipulate a game or manipulate the Internet or manipulate a word processing program. And that event is called Yes, We Code. And it's the beginnings of a movement. We've seen girls' events where it's just all women because it's the basis for entering the global economy. Yeah. It's the basis for understanding how to control your resources in a different way. So there was 45 or so young brothers in a spot downtown called Impact Hub Oakland working on this code. And it occurred to me, it's like there's a couple of different ways. And it was, it was just inspiring to see these young people working. But it also made me think about, but what is the, what is the life code that they need to understand. What if somebody said that they're not only doing, they call them hackathons, they're not only doing hackathons on, the app, on creating apps, but they said these young men are now hacking their lives. You know, they're trying to figure out how to get in there despite what the systems, the public education system and the health system, despite the criminal justice system, despite, in spite of those systems, how can they code themselves to be fully caring, competent, and committed human beings. So not just the computer code. We're interested in their intellectual development, but we're also interested in their spiritual development. All over the African world, we have spiritual blueprints, spiritual code maps, if you will, to guide our lives, if we choose to pay attention, if we choose to hack those systems. Ashe? So what do these signs, symbols, rituals, movements, rhythms, words, what do they mean? What are they teaching us? And we have our ancestors and elders, teachers, who have left the word for us. So in Kemet, we read just part of this passage together. Page 64 is passage number one, the second paragraph. We're just going to read the first two sentences. Because ancestors left us a rich tradition, and if we just mine that tradition, if we decode that tradition, we'll learn a lot. They said... Read this with me. Examine every matter that you may understand it. Do not say, I am learned, but rather set yourself to become wise. We're going to stop right there. Examine every matter. They didn't say examine the things you were interested in. They said examine every matter that you might understand it. What was the code, what's the code language embedded in the Medu Netra? As we learn the Medu, 
What's the code language embedded in the Congolese language? What's the code embedded in what your ancestors were saying to you right here in North America? Examine every matter that you may understand it. And then it gives you an attitude, an orientation. It says, don't act like you know everything. Don't act like you already know. But rather, set yourself to become wise. In other words, hit your reset button. Hit your reset button for your operating system so that you can be wise. So what is this code? We have another elder who just recently passed away. He's not an ancestor. He was from the Congo. His name is Bunseki Fukia. He's a Congolese brother, and he has a, a couple of books about coding and decoding African knowledge, African spiritual practice. And he says that learning is an accumulative process, that we have to learn in, in layers. You have to learn in ways that, that, you know, you scaffold is what educators call it. But learning, spiritual learning, is an accumulative process of coding and decoding cultures. And he says, therefore, it's necessary to study the language of those cultures. He, he essentially says, if you're interested in, if you're an Africanist, if you're a person interested in African spiritual deep thought, how can you do that without understanding the language? So that's why we are we're so interested in the language. You don't have to be all, everybody doesn't have to be an expert linguist, but to understand the words, to be able to tie and untie this knot that our ancestors left from us. Have you ever had to untie a, a knot in uh, your shoestrings or a knot on some rope? It's much easier to untie the knot if you knew how the knot got tied in the first place. Ashe? It's a little bit easier to work with it. The same is true of our spiritual practice. If you understand what went into the thinking, what went into the cultural manifestations of our spiritual practice, the easier it is to decode, to untie it for your own life. Now the Dogon, back to the Dogon idea, this idea of examining every matter. And they gave us a blueprint, a code, for how to decipher things. If there's something you want to know about the Netchers, the Orisha, the Nkisi, whatever the spiritual symbol is, then they say you have to, at least, you have to approach it at least three different levels. Giriso. Everybody say Giriso. Giriso is word at face value. It's just a surface understanding. Most of us walk around in life getting a surface understanding of whatever the thing is. We don't ask the deeper set of questions about, well, why do we have Ivy League schools that are based on all this and we hold them up so high? Because they were based on an illegal, unethical economy based on your labor, right? And then they want to charge you a lot of money to come there and take you through a whole lot of pain to get that degree, right? That's that face value. But if we really understood, we said, wait a minute, this is the children's children's children of the plantation owners now trying to offer me, quote, an education. Then you, if you go into it with that understanding, you're going to approach it quite differently. You might still go there and get the resources, the information, and figure out how to decode what they're doing, all right? But word, giddy so is word at face value. It's the simple explanation. This is how a lot of people look at the, the Christian Bible, on face value, and don't see the symbolism of the stories that are in that book. Ashe? The simple explanation, the simplified adventures of those mythical Orisha and Netras. Sometimes we get caught up in the personalizing of Heru, the personalizing of Aset. Oh, it was a person who did this. It is symbolic. If you look at it on the surface, you just look at the story. But then they said there's a next level, Benny So. Everybody say Benny So. Word on the side. Now, I like this one because that feels like brothers and sisters in America. It's like, come on, we're going to the side. You know, we're going we're gonna to go over here to the side, right? You know, and it includes Giddy So. So you're accumulating word at face value. But then you want to include the next level of study the certain parts of the rituals. You're going to get a chance to look at it because the, the teachers were always holding back a little bit of knowledge because they said, well, you might not be ready for this quite yet. So I give it to you on face value, and if you show yourself as a good student, now we're going to talk about the deeper meaning, the deeper meaning of that ritual, the deeper meaning of that movement, the deeper meaning of that rhythm. So it's word on the side. Then the third level, the third level of decoding is boloso. Say boloso. This is the word from behind. It completes the other stages of giddy so and benny so, but it's still not the truly secret part, but it goes another level deeper. It goes another level. Okay, so if I'm looking at that judgment scene, 
And I'm trying to figure out the weighing of the heart of the heart. If you only see the surface, you say it's the weighing of the heart, the physical heart. But when you read into the, the text further, they say it is the, the word they use is the weighing of words. So what was your word? What was your life word? Not just the spoken word, but what did you think? What did you speak? What did you do? Word with the big W. It's the weighing of words in that judgment scene. But that's that next level. That's the level when you say, wait a minute, wait a words? So you mean everything I said, everything I thought, everything I did, every, all that's being weighed or judged. That's a different level. It's not, it's not like the, the sort of nursery rhyme level. It's the next level. It's the deeper level. And then lastly, they deal with sodai. Everybody say sodai. Sodai, so the clear word. What they call the edifice of knowledge and its ordered complexity. This is when they start looking at how do these things fit together? How does the story of Shu and Tefnut and Newt and Geb, how do those elements of earth and air and water and light, how do they fit together? How did you come into being? What was your body? How did you emerge from new? They get to a different ordered understanding, the higher level thought of that deep code. So giri so, beni so, bolo so, and so die. And other traditions might say it, explain it in different ways, but that's the beauty of being African in this time in North America, as African Americans or American Africans, as my friend Arnold per Perkins would like to say, because we get to pick and choose and select and throw away into the garbage bin of history, as Dr. Nobles would say, things that don't work for us and bring out the things that do work for us. Because we don't have, quote, the blessing of knowing which group you came from, even if you do the genealogy study and the genetics, that's one piece of information. But the beauty of being American Africans in North America we get to pick and choose from all those traditions, whether it's from the Nile Valley, whether it's from the Congo, whether it's from the Mississippi Valley, Ashe, wherever it comes from that's good for us and incorporate that as we go forward. That's a profound blessing that we are uniquely positioned that way to identify ourselves as Africans pulling all these pieces together. So what is this code for living? Examining every matter that you may understand it, saying, I'm not learning. I don't know much. The more, and most of the older folks, you, the older we get, the more we know we don't know. I say. We just have better questions, I think. <laughs> we just have better questions. Because you thought you understood something, but you really didn't know until you had to go through it. You know, until you had to go through something. I say. And they say that, you know, it's in the development of character that instruction succeeds. And further in that text, in the Husea says, learn the structure and functioning of the sky. Learn the structure and function of the earth. What is the code language that the sky and the earth are teaching us? What are our core beliefs that are underlying that code? There's some certain things, some core beliefs that we know we need to understand and then teach to other people, to share with other people. A core belief, a bedrock attitude, something that you can lay a foundation on, something that in your moment of crisis you can rely on. I just want you to think about for a second, in your moment of personal crisis, whatever that looks like, and everybody's is different, what is your core belief? What do you fundamentally believe is true? What do you think is true about God, your relationship to God? What do you believe is true about ancestors? What do you think is true about family, community, the nation, the race? What is your core belief? If you stripped off everything else, what is the thing that's going to help you get over the thing that's going to help you make it through another day when today is difficult. What is your core belief? What is your bedrock attitude that governs your behavior, that governs your response to what is happening? When, when Brother Jeff and I lost parents this past year, our bedrock attitudes govern our behavior, Baba. What we firmly believe and what our parents taught us is critical to how we get through a difficult situation. I say, what we believe is core, thank you, and gets us to the basic fundamental responses to what's happening in the world. You don't have any control over the world. You don't have any control of what happens. But you do have ultimate control over your response to it. That's what the Most High gives us, a will to respond in a certain way. You can choose to be hurt. God, why would you put this on me? Where, where the rest of the family? They supposed to be helping me do this thing. Right. I say somebody know what I'm talking about. 
God, why you put this on me? My children don't act the way I want them to act. God, why we got yet another homicide close to us? Why did you give me this sickness? What is the, the, the thing that's bothering my mind? Most high, why you, we have moments of doubt, Ashe. And at some point, your response is the only thing you can control. You can choose to be angry. You can choose to be hurt. And I'm not denying emotion. Emotion is real. But you have a lot to say, because sometimes you might think about this. You might feel yourself wanting to be mad. You feel like, I just need to be mad at you now. Like, I'm going to make myself be mad. Just be, I'm mad at you. And you can forget what you was mad about, but I'm just going to be mad at you. Just because. And then the scientists are going to tell you what, what you being angry does to your body. What stress it puts on your heart, your blood system. What stress it puts on your mind, right? Core beliefs are acquired through life experience, through worship, through cultural exposure. And you can alter your core beliefs. If your core beliefs are just slightly off, if you still got this idea that God is a man, if you close your eyes and say, let me think about God, and what shows up for you is a white man with a beard on a cloud, you may want to recheck your core belief. Ashe? Because I know that the white folks have worked on your brain, worked on my brain. We got us thinking a certain thing. Whenever something bad happened in your family, if, if one of your nephews, nieces, somebody get caught up with the police, you got to check. Did your first thought go, what did they do? Not, what did the police do? That happened in our family. My nephew, who never gets in trouble, got arrested because he had a bench warrant based on a parking ticket that he didn't even know about. And the way he got treated was like, you know, they threw him in a cell, didn't give him a call. We lost tra- track of him for three days. And people in the family was all going, but Justin will never get in trouble. Like, but, then, but then we had that sneaking feel like, well, he must have done something. See, we need to check our core beliefs about our folk. Even the folks we say we think we enlighten, we think we know. We need, to, we need to work on our core belief. Your core belief can be altered. You get to change how you think about whatever the thing is. Core beliefs are not merely propositions to which a sin is given. They are the ways one trusts or fails to trust. Your core belief, and I saw this from, uh, this is from Dr. Henry Mitchell. He said your core belief, and I had to look at this a couple of times and think about this. He said your core belief is your working opinion or whether God can be trusted. That was a deep statement. I was like, wow, really? Your working opinion about whether God can be trusted. Because when you have a hard moment in your life, you start wondering about God. God, why, why do black people got to go through all this? Why do children got to go through what they're going through? Why everybody don't eat on the planet? Can God be trusted? Your core belief as an African says yes. And it comes out in all kinds of ways. Like We always say things like, God not going to put more on you than you can bear. That's a trust statement. That's a trust statement, if that's your core belief. If you end it with a question, does God put more on you than you can bear? Then you got to really explore what, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about your relationship to the Most High? Core beliefs are embraced intuitively and emotionally, sometimes without the ability to even express it. You just know you know. You just know what you know. Core beliefs are most authentically expressed, though, when they're uttered spontaneously in a crisis moment. When you're having a crisis, you go like, oh, speak mine and do mine. Because you have a choice, right? You're going like, I could like twist this a little bit and get what I want, but that wouldn't be my life. You know, you got that, like, that little back and forth thing that goes on, right? You know, but it's it usually a core belief will be uttered spontaneously when you're having a crisis. The wholeness and, and this is an interesting idea, the wholeness and emotional, ba- emotional balance are implied in core beliefs. Your core belief system ought to be your blueprint for being a balanced person, for being emotionally, mentally, spiritually healthy. It ought to enable you to function at full capacity, physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. Your core beliefs are what you have to decode. Your core beliefs, like, God won't put more on you than you can bear. I say. Like, we have to trust spirit absolutely for guidance, yes. not conditionally. You cannot trust God sometimes and think it's going to work out. 
you got to put your entire faith in this informed faith. It's informed by your experiences, what your ancestors have said, what your elders have said, what you know to be true. But you have to you have to trust spirit. Absolutely. And I had this I had a moment a few weeks ago where when I came back from my trip, it was great. And I walked back into all this work that I have to do, things I had to catch up on. And I had to remind myself, sometimes you need to have a conversation with yourself. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you just have to say, Grit. <laughs> Bob Grit. <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you were looking around, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> you have to remind yourself of certain things. And it was this feeling that when I was, I feel like I had this much stronger when I was a younger person. And I had to remind myself of this that whatever it is, God is not going to leave you out here by yourself to figure this out. Because okay. I'm walking around feeling like I got all this stuff. Dun, 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 like a superhero or something, you know, like I'm carrying all this stuff. And it was like, wait, 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 drop your shoulders, you know, let that stuff like fall off. You do your part, God going to do God's part. Okay. I had to remind myself of a core belief that I held for a long time. Sometimes you have to just stop. Say, bruh, just let me remind you of something you know. And sometimes we're waiting around for other people to remind us. No, you know. You know a lot. There's other core beliefs that ancestors are real and present and can intercede on your behalf as the eyes and ears on both sides of reality. This is reality and so is the ancestral world. It's both reality. Some people call it Orun for the heavenly part. They call it uh, Aye for the worldly part and then water in the middle. Everybody got a different conception of this throughout the African world. But it's a core belief. Another core belief is that spirit resides in all things at all times. Another core belief that serving others is necessary. It's a necessary equivalent to serving God. The way you serve God is by serving your brothers and sisters. Another core belief is let go and let God. If you've done all you can do, sometimes you just got to let go. And sometimes whatever it was that got you over in one situation, the thing that helped you may not be the thing that's going to help you in the next situation. That's a story I want to tell, and I didn't make it up. Once upon a time, there's this man, and he was traveling along through the forest, and he was on this long journey. He was traveling alone, so he had to rely on all of his own thoughts and his devices to get through this journey that he was on. And when he got to a very rapid river, a river that he couldn't swim or walk across, he said to himself, let me build myself a raft. And so he looked around in the forest and he got logs and he got vines and he tied them together and he made this sturdy raft and he launched it into the water and jumped on it and was able to cross the river. And because he thought this raft was so well built, he said, let me keep this raft with me. So for the next few miles, he had this raft and he had put it up on his shoulders and it was heavy because these logs was wet and heavy and the vines was tough and he was walking and walking and Walk in, and after a couple of days of carrying this raft around, he said, well, maybe I should let this raft go. Maybe I don't need this raft anymore. There's something you're carrying around with you from some previous part of your life that you need to let go. It might have been some teaching that you thought was really good way back when. Then maybe it's time to let that go. Maybe it's time to put that raft on the side and let somebody else see that raft come along and say, oh, well, look what God left for me. Because sometimes your, 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 what you discard is what somebody else needs, Ashe. So don't be selfish. Let it go. Maybe what you was doing with it wasn't, wasn't the highest purpose. You used it for what you needed it for. There's some things institutionally, Jose, well, we keep doing because we've been doing it that we need to let go. Bob Jai, there's some things we need to let go. Ashe, it's something we need to just stop because it's holding us back. We're carrying all this weight. What we need to be doing, no, why don't we take care of ourselves, take care of our children, decode what it is that we know to be true about African spirituality, and leave other stuff aside. We can do that. Ancestors are going to be smiling. Oh, look at that. They're going to have a little meeting. Ancestors are going to have a meeting. They put the raft down. <laughs> they let the raft go. <laughs> you can put it in the museum. You can say, this is what we used back in 1982. It was great. <laughs> We're in 2013. Why are we in 2014? It's time. Ashe. So we need to use the natures, use the Orisha, and use the Nkisi, however we use those images and decode them and be like Jehuti. See, that's the whole point of the natures. It's like relate to them as symbolic 
manifestations of a code. Jehudi looks like an ibis bird, that long beak. You see his image in the judgment scene, that long beak. And the way ibis birds work is in swampy water. They have long enough legs. They're up above the water itself. They have a, the, at the end of their beak, they have a little sieve. And it filters the muddy sediments away and only brings in the small microbes that they eat and water. We need to be like, we need to have the same discernment because everything in this community, everything in the world, everything in the African world ain't necessarily good. We need to let some stuff go. Ashe, you want the, only the good part to come. We need to use the symbols. If you relate to Shango, use the symbol of fighting. Fighting what and fighting how? If you're related to, you know, I, I said, what did I said do as that seat of authority? When you have a seat of authority, you don't have to talk a whole lot. You just are. You use your authority. Sometimes silently. Sometimes just like your mama has certain authority based on a look. Ashe. Sometimes your parents had a th- just on the way they look, body language. And that pursed lip, them arm po- they, you didn't have to, they didn't have to explain it to you. Ashe. You just knew, oh man, I'm in trouble. Or let me not get in trouble by doing this thing I'm supposed to do. The manifestation of spirit is for us to use, for us to learn from, for us to grow from. And one of the things that a, a, a profound sister in Brazil said, she, her name is uh, uh, Valginia Pinto, and she runs one of the Condomble houses. And she was breaking down from the Congo tradition, the Nkisi, and the symbolism of, that, a, that spirit is in every tree, in every rock, in every river. And you combine that to the Orisha, so that personal prototype and the natural, it's all one system. But when she broke it down, what she said was, you know, it was almost like she wanted to say it like this. She didn't say it quite this way, but she said, baby, it's all about energy. This is all, all of these are representations of energy. How energy moves about in creation. How energy has an impact on con- consciousness has an impact on energy and matter to create things. That's our tradition. That's what we've been teaching up for a long time in the classes that we teach here, is that the natures are symbols. The natures are code language for how energy moves around. You're the prototype of some energy, how you move around. Examine every matter that you may understand it. What is your code? Examine every matter. What is your core belief? Examine every matter. Do you believe that ma'at is what you think, what you speak, what you do? Examine every matter. Then Guzo Saba is your social code for how you do business and move around in the world. Examine every matter that you may understand it. Do not say I am learning, but rather set yourself to become wise. Be gentle and patient. Then your character will be beautiful. It is in development of it is in the development of character that instruction succeeds. Learn the structure and functioning of the sky. Learn the structure and functioning of the earth. Ashe. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me if you would as we close out. I'm gonna open this up to anyone who is not a member of Wose who wants to be a part of this community. We invite you at this time. Looks like we're all family. to be aware of any of the Oma Day events, any other Black History Month events. Bob and Jeff, what's up? All right. <laughs> um, Re-knitting our sacred tapest- tapestry, uh, community oh, report from African world. There's going to be something at the Black Repertory Theater. I'm assuming yeah. everyone knows where that is. 3201 Adeline Street, Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And the program is going to be from 1 to 4. And mm-hmm. Today. people who will be involved are, among them, Wade Nobles, uh, oh, yeah. Dr. Rosalind Jeffries. Mm-hmm. Where are your glasses Brown. at, man? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where are your glasses? Yeah, I know. Your arm is so Gerald Grills and Rachel Bayard Cooks, mm. among others. So uh, that's going to go on from 1 to 4. Today. 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 Uh, so you want to run out of here? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eat school, cool. though. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is there's some um, 
Marcus Books handouts on the table for those of you who want to find out more about what's going on in Marcus Books. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. All right. And then the last thing is uh, we have uh, updates from the uh, newsletter. So the basic newsletter is on the table, and then there's some additional number one update. So that's that's the report. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On, on the well, table, too, are back. some of the um, information that Basola gave us. <coughs> strips of paper on that table, too. With the so. link to that video. Okay. To, the okay. video. to the video. And yeah. then I also okay. have an announcement about um, my group, uh, Odima Performance Ensemble. I will um, perform with uh, Friends of Negro Spirituals in San Francisco on two dates. That is, on um, Tuesday the 14th, we will perform at the um, San Francisco Library at uh, 4400 Mission Street. That's in the Mission uh, near Silver Street. And then on the... Uh, Tuesday? Tuesday, that's the 11th. 11th. The 11th, and that'll be at 7 in the evening at, at the Mission, at the Excelsior Branch Library in uh, San Francisco, and then on the uh, 16th, we will perform at 3 o'clock at the Third Baptist Church in San Francisco. Right. Well, one more quick announcement. Uh, on the February the 15th, myself and Mama Connie um, joined some other folks going to Cuba, hmm. and if you would uh, keep us in your uh, prayers that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be safe, and, uh, hey, sure. you know, How long you be gone? 10 days. I just want to thank uh, uh, all the Stones of Fire for coming out to the poetry celebration yesterday and a special shout out to Brother Cinnabar. Special shout out to Brother Cinnabar for putting our sound system back together with some technical problems, lots of amplifier and mm -hmm. So he got us back in business this morning with his up and running. Yeah, the master, the master. Than so, All right, thank you. Center bar. Right. One last announcement. Um, I have some um, some uh, African thread wrap um, Calendar. calendars. They were put <laughs> together by uh, 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 an um, artiste extraordinary, uh, Anana Scott. She does the thread oh, wrap. Yeah. She's also uh, does all kinds of African hairstyling, and so she's got. I know it's February, but it's a beautiful calendar, uh, representations of of black, you know, African women that 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 like how we look, you know, sure. our, our, uh, our the uh, the uh, uh, what the beauty standards that we have been affected by are not the ones that we need to live by. So these are wonderful representations, and you should take a look. They're fifteen dollars, and so I'm gonna help my sister out. Sales. And I have one last shameless plug. Um, if anybody wants to help out with the web or video or audio, please get with me. Or if you know youth that want to learn it, please get with me. And uh, that would be nice to, uh, to uh, have, uh, have it you know, go forward. Okay. That's just that's right. Cool. <coughs> one last thing, and I'll send more out about this. February 22nd, which is a Saturday at 10 a.m. to noon at Merritt College. Um, those of us who were part of the Fulbright Hayes Fellowship to Brazil mm. are going to be presenting. Um, so everybody on that team is going to be there that day, and uh, the community is invited. I'll send out another notice to okay. uh, make sure folks have it, uh, and that gets included. All right. Um, lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of this. has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory is won 
all and the ones who have taught us for countless generations that we are one people, one people, having one faith, one faith, one aim, one, aim, one, aim, one destiny, one destiny, one God. One God. Let's call that name that our ancestors have taught us for countless generations. Let us all say, Amen. You are the most beautiful people on the face of this earth. I Oh, you just take care of him. When you guys say yes, I'm good. Well, you going to start coming more often? Yeah. Don't need that drama, man. Don't be scared. Come on, man. Come on. Tell you, come on. Don't get off it. Don't get all nervous. It was because the guy was somebody was playing your drum. You didn't want to play? Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, just come on. I'll do it. 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 I'll do